Thomas, that guy in the Bible that's just kind of a mystery. He doesn't rate real high on the popularity chart, but there are things we can learn from the life and experience of Thomas. Join us today for part two with Noah Baxter on the topic of doubt. Hey. Welcome back to the channel. So glad to be back. Today we're going to talk about one of the disciples who's known for his journey of doubt, and that would be Thomas. Mm -hmm. And recently you gave a teaching at church about Thomas, and I found it so interesting. Would you talk to us a little bit about who he was as a person from your research of scripture and and also uh, just looking at church history. Yeah, yeah, Thomas, it was just su super fun to do a deep dive into that. I'd actually, I was in a conversation with somebody and I don't even remember the whole content of the conversation, but I remember having that story come onto my heart and just that moment where Jesus like walks across the room when he's, you know, doubting Thomas and Jesus has been raised from the dead and where he walks across the room and meets his demand of like, unless I see the holes in his hands, unless I get to put my hand in his side. And I was so moved by that moment, whereas growing up and just being around church, I'd heard the message preached about doubting Thomas and that last verse of the passage where Jesus says, you believe because you have seen, but blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. And it always felt like a reprimand. It was like, dang it, doubting Thomas, get it together. <laughs> and just my perspective was shifted because the, the more I've, I've grown in just diving into the story of God and diving into scripture, just different things stand out to me a lot more. Uh, and, you know, coming to it with a fresh lens to pay attention to what sticks out that's new. And that moment where Jesus meets his crazy demand stuck out to me so much. And so I just noticed this tension of Okay, here's Jesus meeting Thomas's exact demand, while also this loving, it's, it's, it's like he's calling him higher. And so I did just this deep dive into, okay, man, what could God be doing in this moment? And I, I dug into what could, pos what could Thomas be feeling in this moment? And so Jesus is just raised from the dead. He's showed up to all the disciples. He, he breathed on them to receive the Holy Spirit. Everyone was there except Thomas. Like, could you imagine being the one that wasn't there? What a bummer. Like, fear of missing out. FOMO is something that's running rampant in our culture. Like, and that would be the ultimate FOMO. I can imagine yeah. showing up. You know, he shows up after and they're like, hey, we just saw Jesus. We got to we got to touch the wounds. Like he's, he's really alive. And he's like, what are you serious? And I wasn't there. Like, who could you imagine? What could be going through his head? Like one, he's seen Jesus brutally murdered and crucified. The one who he's left everything to follow. He's given his life to for three years has just been brutally murdered and crucified. So he's probably deep in the middle of the grieving process. Right. Definitely. You know, it's only been a few days. Yeah. And so there's a, the initial disappointment of, man, everything that I've been, been working with and working towards and been a part of for this time, this man that I love, it's just been ripped from me. And so when he hears that he's alive and he shows up to the disciples, are you kidding me? I saw, I saw the Romans put those nails through his hands. In his feet, I, I saw them pierce his side. I watched people spit at him and mock him. And there's just that initial disappointment of the loss. And then there's the disappointment of the fact that he was not there. Why me? Why me? Why would he show up to all the other disciples? I mean, he, if he is who he said he was, 
if he is God and I've seen him know things about people without even knowing them, how could he not know that I wasn't going to be there? Yeah, Why didn't he a, wait till I showed up? That's such a unique thing to consider, isn't it? Hmm. <clears throat> How it would yeah. feel to be the one that missed out. Mm. And why did that happen that way? Yeah. Yeah. And, and how many of us relate to that, that emotion in our culture? We've, we've put, I mean, COVID put that into mm-hmm. perspective for such a wide range of people. Putting your, your life into something, putting your hope into something and dreaming about something only to see it get ripped from you, you know, when COVID hit. Mm-hmm. Whether it was jobs or houses or dreams that you had just put on pause or ripped from you entirely. Right. Like so many of us relate to that, whether it was COVID or not, we've, we've, many of us have experienced it. And so many of us have experienced other people getting to experience the, the miracle that we've been contending for and that we've been hoping for. I mean, I imagine how Thomas after that moment, longed to see Jesus and really probably longed to see him more than all the other disciples did. He's, he's grieved and, and hurt in such a way. And he's like, no, unless I get to see him. And he just wants to see him so bad. And there's, there's probably this, this disappointment and jealousy that he didn't get to see him. And as much as he would love to celebrate with the disciples, he's asking the questions, why not me? And I think many of us ask those questions and so then it moves on to the 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 moment where it says then eight days later like what an interesting detail eight days go by that is like why why does jesus wait eight days (laughs) and this is where you know i played around with this idea that you know maybe maybe god knows something about thomas that he's actually using this eight days to transform him Maybe he knows that, that Thomas actually, maybe Thomas needs to work through these emotions of, of doubt and disappointment. And this disappointment probably drives him to a place where I think his statement of doubt, I'm not going to believe until I see, was more a, a, a moment of disappointment and a, a desire and a desperation to see Jesus than it was doubt as we think about it. But it was a, you know, a statement of doubt. And so he wrestles with, and I imagine this eight days gives him plenty of time, you know, Mm -hmm. and yeah, so it's just so interesting. And then by the end of the eight days, I'm, I'm sure that he's just, he's desperate and he's like, gosh, I just want to see Jesus. And then finally Jesus shows up. And the first thing he does, he walks in all the disciples. I imagine want to swarm him and, and see him. And he just, he says, peace to you. And then he walks right up to Thomas. And I imagine him like all the disciples trying to swarm him and he just walks right past all of them and he's got a mission and he walks right up to Thomas and this crazy demand that he makes. How many times do we just make crazy demands to God? Like it's got to happen this way. I need you to do this for me. And sometimes we think that like, you know, those, those, those are childish games that we're playing and, you know, maybe they are, but for some reason, Jesus doesn't have a problem one waiting eight days to do it on his own timetable and two meeting Thomas's exact demands where he needs to be met. And so he walks across the room and shows him the holes in his hands. And he's like, here, put your hand in my side, see for yourself. Don't be unbelieving, but believing something that uh, Nate Edwardson pointed out to me when I was digging into this. He's like, you know, this whole story doesn't even use the word doubt. And yet we call him doubting Thomas. Oh, I'm like, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. It says unbelief, but it never says doubt. And, you know, all these other disciples get cool nicknames like John the Beloved and (laughs) Peter the Rock. And then we have Doubting Thomas. Like, what a bummer to have that nickname. Um, And, you know, then that moment where he actually says, hey, don't don't be unbelieving, but believing. And then then um, Thomas responds and says, my Lord, my God. And it's actually this declaration of his divinity that like none of the other disciples had made yet he's like my lord my god like it's it's you Mm -hmm. you're really him and jesus says well you believe because you have seen but there are those who haven't seen and yet believe i think this is more of less of a reprimand and more of a of a transformative 
statement of love that's like, guess what, Thomas? I, I met you here right now and I'll meet you here. But I'm going to be gone soon. I'm going to be out of here. And you're not going to be able to, to see me walk across the room and show you these wounds. But I think Jesus is leaving him with this memory that's actually empowering him to become the person that he's made to be. He meets him right where he's at, but he also calls him forth. And something that I love talking about when I preach the message, as I was so curious, is so Thomas's nickname is the twin. And when it's actually written in, in the original language, John actually just calls him the twin. He never has the name Thomas. The name Thomas is like a, a transliteration of what was written as the twin. So we could, you know, understand it as, you know, a name that he had. And I was so curious, well, why is he called the twin? And so I looked it up and there's some different speculations, but one of them is that he was called the twin because he physically looked like Jesus. And I was like, whoa, that's cool. Like this guy who physically looks like Jesus, Jesus is taking this moment to make him look more like Jesus internally. And so that was something that was just super fun to talk about and yeah. something that, you know, I think it just speaks to what, what I feel like Jesus is doing in, in this moment of Thomas's doubt. He's not ashamed. He's not afraid. He's not disgusted. He's not dismayed. He's, he's not like, oh my goodness, Thomas, are you serious? You didn't believe me. He's, he walks right across the room to him and then he calls him higher. And it's so funny that we call him Doubting Thomas because Doubting Thomas goes on to the church history tells us that he goes on to be a missionary uh, in India or Iraq. Uh, and he goes far east to India, maybe farther east than any of the other disciples. And he starts like seven churches. And this sounds like a man of great faith. This sounds like a man who's transformed and radically on fire for Jesus, yet we've called him Doubting Thomas. You realize what a negative label <clears throat> that, that is and how we've kind of all passively adopted that without really realizing what a key transition and period of growth this was for him. And like you yeah. said, like preparation for greater ministry mm. to come yeah yeah one of the things i said in the message was like i wonder if those who have wrestled the deepest with doubt disappointment and this desperation and um disillusionment I, I wonder if those people aren't the ones who who can go the farthest for god because yeah. that wrestling that so much preparation and it, it's so interesting one of my friends said this one time and it bugged me when he said it, but I think it's true in a lot of ways. But he said some of the, I, I can't remember. I think he said, he got the quote from somebody else. I don't know exactly who it was from, but he said that the people of the greatest faith are also the people of the greatest doubt. And I was like, that doesn't even make any sense. But I think the, the farther you go along, the more it makes sense. Because no matter how many times we've seen God do crazy, wonderful things, we go farther and farther along in our faith journey and God is calling us to do bolder and greater and crazier things. And the, the crazier it gets and the more faith we need for what God's doing, there's also this layer of like, I am so far out of my comfort zone and my own strength. Like there, there's this, I don't know how to describe it, but there's just this distance between like, either what I'm doing is completely crazy or it's totally God. <laughs> and that, and I think so many people wrestle with that. And, you know, the farther we get, you know, especially with new dreams placed on our heart. I mean, I was even noticing it last night. I, I was in prayer before our uh, youth night and the Lord was giving me some words for my team. And I'm good with encouraging words. But I think when it starts to get specific with prophetic words, I get, I get really worried that I'm going to miss it. <laughs> and so it's like this testing of, of my faith and this challenging where this doubt surfaces, but this doubt is actually an invitation to go deeper. And okay, do I really trust what I feel like he's speaking to me and trust that if I miss it, he's good enough to, to fill in the gaps and see where I missed it. Mm -hmm. you know 
And I think that's, that's where it goes back to this, this fear of doubt that we have. We feel like we need to protect and defend against it as if God's not big enough to meet people in it. As if Jesus isn't big enough to walk right across the room and give them exactly what they need to become the, the Thomases who go as a missionary to India. I, I just find that, that, that so interesting. There's this quote from Brennan Manning in this book, Ruthless Trust, that's just super, super good. So he tells the story of the cracked pot. And basically, it's this, this, this guy has these two pots that he kind of personifies the pots. And he's going to get water to bring the, the pots back just for, for drinking water. And sorry, only one of the, the, the pots is cracked. So he brings them, they fill up water and the cracked pot feels super self-conscious and worried about itself because he's like, I can't even do the thing that I, I was made to do. So they go get water, he comes back and he, he, so he talks to his master that's, you know, using him and he's like, why do you keep using me? Like, why do, why do you, I can't even do what I was made to do? I'm not, not even working for the purpose you made me to do. And the master's like, so next time we go down this path, I want you to pay attention to the flowers that are on the side of the field and there are that, that are on the side of the path. And so they walk and kind of cheers the crack pot up a little bit. And he's like, but still, I don't get it. Sure. Those were beautiful flowers, but like, why, why do you use me? Why do you still think I have a, a, any value? And he says, well, what you don't know is that I've actually been using that crack that you've had to water these flowers and I get to pick these flowers and use them as a gift that I, I, you, I put them on my master's table to, to, to beautify like, you know, the table and the design. And it's this beautiful story that, you know, despite our cracks, despite our flaws, despite our mess, like God is actually using the things that we think disqualify us that we think are, actually failing that we think are screw ups and there he's using them for his glory and he uses the saint augustine quote that says god works to everything for good even our sins yeah. and just like this mind-blowing thing and then he uses these funny examples as like consider the the counselor who was so bad that the person ended up going to the right counselor <laughs> consider, consider a man who who experiences a, a murder in his neighborhood and goes to a pastor to try to work it through. And the pastor's so clueless and so inconsiderate that the, the guy who has experienced the murder feels what it's like to want to murder someone <laughs> and then goes in and does work to restore his community because he's inspired. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this idea that like, man, God is so much bigger than we imagine him to be. What if we could, could rest knowing that the fate of the world, the fate of the church, the fate of what God's doing in his will probably does not depend on what we do next. Yeah. And that's such a, a pressure off kind of feel. And it's not to take away responsibility. Obviously, we still have responsibility to, to follow Jesus and to, to, to come to know him more. But we're human and we're going to make mistakes and we're going to wrestle with doubt and we're going to wrestle with these human emotions. And if we think that, that God's not big enough to use them for his good and to restore things, I, I mean, have, have we read the Bible? <laughs> have we looked at the people that he uses? I mean, we want to talk about these, these big fathers of faith, you know, we talk about Abraham, we talk about David, we talk about Peter, we talk about Thomas, we talk about John. And all these people had messes of stories and so many things that they did wrong. All these doubts, all these wrong beliefs that they had, but God was big enough to, to use them still. Mm -hmm. And it became a beautiful part of his story. And I think that's what the life of Thomas, as well as the, the biblical story as the whole tends to tell us. And I think it's a super inviting thing for many of us who have made many mistakes, who have wrestled with doubt. I think it's an invitation for us to show the same grace that Jesus does. <laughs>
this is going to be a big dose of encouragement, I think, for people. I hope people will go back and read John 20 and, mm. and really think about a lot of the things you've presented today. Mm. So thank you so much again for being with us. Yeah, no problem. Glad, glad to be a part of it. Thanks for inviting me. Sure, we'll have you back again. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Noah.